I just want to say a few words about lessons from the region on multipolarity. You know, in uh, multipolarity is an idea born in the trauma in Russia in the trauma of the 90s, popularized in Latin America by Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez, and today the BRICS is the main vehicle for multipolarity. But simultaneously, we have developments in the region, so I think there may be some broader lessons there I want to draw our attention to. The first one is counter-hegemonic regionalism, something that's been going on in Latin America for 200 years, brought to a head by the late Hugo Chavez with the creation of the progressive bloc, the ALBA, the broader blocs, CELAC and UNASUR. And these are blocs that were intended to create as a buffer or by unifying regional forces against the great hegemonic powers, first of all, the Spanish Empire and then the North Americans, basically. And it was said very eloquently by many Latin American progenitors that they have to be, the, the trees have to form ranks so the giant with the seven league boots couldn't walk between them. The idea was that, that little nations can't exist against big, big powers unless they come together and form those unions. And I think there are lessons for, in Latin America, for other regions. Second, the regional security coordination that we see now in the axis of resistance, countries in, in West Asia, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and West Africa's Sahel Alliance. That security coordination may be a precursor to the formation of counter-hegemonic regional blocks to advance regional leverage. Third, cooperation in the face of siege warfare. Of course, BRICS is the main organism for this these days. Financial and economic cooperation has become necessary for many, about two dozen independent nations subject to these unilateral coercive measures, which they pretend to call sanctions these days. BRICS and the SCO are the major hope for the coordination of such cooperation, in particular through energy cooperation, currency swaps, and a new financial architecture. For the developmental logic of BRICS, there are many nations that are not themselves subject to siege measures and are looking for a viable alternative to escape the unipolarity and the dictatorship of the dollar, but without necessarily inviting reprisals from the hegemonic powers. This can be seen already in the BRICS membership of subordinate allies of the US, Egypt, the Emirates, and Saudi Arabia. Clearly these states believe they can take advantage of the new opportunities in BRICS without breaking in all respects from their patron. And so that developmental that development underlines the importance of explaining the developmental logic for BRICS. There are there are real possibilities for all nations, even though they aren't subject to these siege measures. Fifth, strong rights enabling independent states. This breaks with neoliberal logic, which says that all of the non-hegemonic states must be very weak and allow their political economy to be dominated by multinational corporations from the, the hegemonic states. Uh, but that's not possible in today's world. With the neoliberal aggression which demands the, those weak states, uh, strong independent states are necessary to facilitate citizens' rights to establish and defend independent policy and practice. Weak independent states can be destroyed in today's predatory world. Of course, they're going to be abused in dictatorships by the actual dictators of the world, but suffering such abuse is better than obliteration. Strategic independence may even require preemptive defence, as Russia has exercised with its special military operation in southeast Ukraine. The sixth, alliances with shared principles but diverse cultures. This has been mentioned already um, in relation to Indonesia and ASEAN, unity and diversity, um, and the ALBA and, and the emerging West Asian alliance make this point to new regional blocs need not imply incorporation to a new local hegemonic grouping. Diverse cultures, ideologies and systems can work together for mutual benefit. In this way, Secular pluralist Syria is closely aligned to the Islamic Republic of Iran, while socialist humanist Cuba remains close to Bolivia, a state based on indigenous concepts of living well, the VFN. Seven, opposing normalization, and the last point, opposing normalization with fascist regimes. We know that Russia finds it impossible to coexist with a neighboring regime which was anti-Russian, neo-Nazi, uh, determined to destroy the Russian people or even dismantle the Russian Federation. And so that's led to the demands for denazification in that, in that uh, region. Similarly, the emerging Palestinian state cannot be asked to coexist with a genocidal apartheid Israeli regime committed to racial massacres, ethnic cleansing, and ongoing land theft. Comparable Arab elites might fall for the bribes of a mythical two-state solution, but it's not generally viable. At best, a pathway to a Bantustan-style ghetto 
or at worst an ongoing war of annihilation. So no nation can be asked to normalize with such fascist regimes. A democratic Palestine requires the dismantling of apartheid Israel, a single democratic state which addresses historic land theft and justice for the millions of displaced refugees. So I suggest these elements of the multi process in the region deserve wider attention and maybe some lessons in that. Uh, замечательно. 